to this particular duel. But with that being said, we're going to jump here into game one. Soon we'll find out who won that all important die roll. I'll go first. And we have Tillaments versus Exodia. And it Absolutely. does sound like Jeffrey has won the die roll. Oh, are we going to see it go all the way through? Now, Tillaments, not known to play disruptions from the hand, so this may just let him go all the way. So the Tyrolean strategy does have some points of interaction here. Oh, There's Herald of the Orange Light, which is sometimes played in the strategy because of the fairy count. In addition to that, you could also potentially see a one of halfness end up putting a card like Shadal Winda on the field with <laughs> your your mills are blessed. Uh, okay, so we're going to start uh, off Aqua with Dolphin. connector into the Aqua Dolphin. Aqua Dolphin is going to get a quick little peek at uh, Justin's hand. That for cost. And this will not only give us insight into whether or not Justin has any interaction, it's also going to tell Jeffrey if the coast is clear. We're going to send the Fire Flint Lady as the cost. And oh, the coast is not completely clear. There is a Kelbeck. Kelbeck can summon out and just put a card back, but will it matter? I'll select that. Although we know what Jeffrey is trying to accomplish, which is to assemble all five pieces of the Forbidden One on the opening turn, exactly the pathway to get there is not something that we're sure of. So it'll be interesting to see if Kelbeck can actually work as an interruption. So we're going to take the two warrior monsters, and we're going to put a Link Summon into Assault. Search, first effect. The two tails of the Noble Knights. So typically you search a card... Generally speaking, that's just going to be discarded somewhere along the lines of your combo. That's what a lot of the decks that are using a soul do with the first effect. And then, of course, now the second effect is going to put a monster on the field that will likely reveal exactly where Jeffrey's going to be going with this opening turn. So he did manage to add an Ignite, a Pendulum Monster. Now this, this deck is going to incorporate, as we're starting to see it, a variety of fire warrior monsters. There's Ignites in here. There's, in addition to that, a variety of other warrior monsters. It seems as though Jeffrey's strategy is in some way, shape, or form based on the idea of putting two warriors on the field as fast as possible, as reliable as possible, and getting a sold. Oh, we are going to see the Kelbeck activated because a card was sent from the deck to the graveyard that's going to summon a Kelbeck and return uh, the assault back into the extra deck. That could be a disruption, but I don't know if that's going to be enough. I genuinely am sitting along for the ride with you, watching Jeffrey pilot his strategy. Because he knew that card was in Justin's hand, I have to assume he knows the path from this point with his combo deck. Back to my hand. Yeah, and he's going to add back the Durandal. Durandal can activate and just add another Fire War and just maybe keep going. I have to imagine, based on his... I mean, I see an instant fusion in his hand. His deck actually has a very iconic and legendary Fire Warrior monster that he can summon out of the extra deck, and a variety of others that potentially with a card like... And it's something fusion. that you'd never see play. It's actually a Thank card you. that in the near future is going to, I believe, get some revisions and some, some oh, yeah. releases. In, in some way. In some way, yes. I think Jeff is right now mapping out his turn. Now, each play when you're piloting a combo deck like Jeffrey is that is so invested into one path. Every individual play can really matter. And sometimes when there's that interaction, in this case, putting back the Assault to the extra deck, mm -hmm. when you're playing and practicing a strategy like this, you need to be wary of, okay, X has happened. I now need to pivot my strategy. I can still get to the end result, but it's a different line of decisions. The tree of decision-making has to be altered a little bit. Mm -hmm. But right now, it should be more or less green light for Jeffrey. You've seen the hand. The main disruption, Kelbeck, has already been activated. So we're, I guess uh, Justin is also along for the ride now. So here he's searching out Ignis Phoenix, the Draco Slayer. So this is a card that was popular in the Draco Slayer strategies that came out last year. Uh, this card is actually a singleton that he's going to be using with the other Ignite monsters that are incorporated in his deck list. Now he's also now going to play the Instant Fusion. Yeah, so I commented on noticing that he had a copy of Instant Fusion in his hand earlier. Now here is the Flame Swordsman. Talk about coming with an iconic deck strategy. Absolutely. You I have... was going to instant contact. He's just making everything instantly. <laughs> he has brought both Exodia the Forbidden One, Flame Swordsman, and now this is another blast from the past. It looks like he's brought out Elemental Hero Flare Neos and going into a second copy of Assault. I think every single monster that's a fusion for him is a warrior. Oh, that is definitely going to be the case. He has another pretty iconic one in there, too. Dark Flare Knight, a card that was popular uh, in the back if you want to go play the Ultimate Time Wizard side events. Mm -hmm. and then He's I'm going to use the here. Pendulum okay. Scale effect of the Ignite, destroying both. And now he's going to be able to search his deck for a Fire Warrior. 
And then when the Ignis is destroyed, including in the Pendulum Zone, you can special summon one Draco Slayer monster from your deck. Yeah. Or an Ignite monster. You know, typically this card has been seen in Draco Slayer strategies, but actually has the branch over to the Ignite strategy as well. You know, Jeffrey's really showcasing a variety of cards that we don't see all that often. But if he gets all the way there with just simply these two cards, it just means a two fire or just two warrior monster would maybe lead into Exodia. Yeah, we saw that his opening play began with the Neo Space Connector, which is probably his ideal opening play because getting access to the Aqua Dolphin allows him to check to see if the coast is clear. Okay. Rock stab back. So now we have the Symphonic Warrior Rocks. This isn't a team. It's created a different way. Oh, this is? Mm -hmm. uh, it does. I believe it does count as a tuner because it was special summoned. The Warrior Rocks has an alternate summon condition that's unique to its own effect. I don't believe it has to worry about the Warrior effect or the tuner. With Renaud and Gallant. And Gallant, yes. But this isn't a tuner. Renaud might not be a so tuner in this becomes, case. This becomes a tuner. From, oh, from oh the but summon from the mm -hmm. Ignister. Or the Ignis. Oh, yes. Yeah, so Ignis. Okay. The Ignis Draco Slayer okay. does make it a We're tuner. Good. We're all good. Rather. We're continuing. No, um, Jeff knows what he's doing. This is what happens when you get old, Justin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so effect to add back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, effect to add back the Templar. Yeah, when Warrior Rocks is special summoned, you can add one phase of Pendulum Monster from your extra deck back to your hand. Pay 1,200 to search. And we're going to go with Beyond the Pendulum. We're going to be able to add a Pendulum card. Now, if you don't perform a Pendulum summon, everything is more or less negated. Something tells me Jeffrey knows exactly how he was going to be able to perform a Pendulum Summon this turn to circumvent that. Scale. He's got the scales. Scale. Both scales. Yep. Looks like a pair of Ignite. And now he's unlocked his true potential. Harmonizing. Harmonizing effect. Summon out another magician from the deck, Pendulum 1. And we're going to see Purple Poison. It's Purple Poison. That's a lot of monsters. Yeah, Jeffrey knows exactly what he's going to do now. It seems like he's hit the point of the combo that's familiar, the yeah. point of the combo that he's probably gone Dash. through and practiced a, a can a countless times before this event. Yeah. That one interaction, you know, required him to recalibrate a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we'll soon find out. Here we are. The first Exodia piece has made it into Jeffrey's hand. And look the at first Justin's Exodia. face. Maybe Justin thought that, hey, this is maybe an uh, Infer Noble Ignite, but clearly no longer the case. Star? Oh, look at Justin. I think he's starting to realize that he is about to experience Exodia the Forbidden One on the very first turn. Dumping Blue Dragon Summoner. Okay. Uh, he's just sent the Blue Dragon Summoner into the graveyard. Okay. So it seems like um, if there is a repetitive way for him to summon Time Star Magician, okay, that may be the way in which he assembles all five pieces to Exodia. We're going to see a Link Summon now. Selene is going to gain counters. Selene? We do have Spellcasters in the graveyard. That's going to gain some counters. There's three counters on the Selene. Use, use this. I believe you can summon back the also, three Blue, Dragons, uh, Blue Dragon Summoner. Oh, yes. Thank you. There has to be a reason why he threw that into the graveyard. Five, yeah, it should be five. Counters. The Pendulum Zones do count when Selene is counting the spells both on the field and in the Selene. graveyard. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of uh, spell counters. Yeah, typically five, three is the point in which you care about, obviously, to be able to special summon, but... Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Now, where are we going to take this play now? There's stuff in the graveyard that can't be special summoned back. I'm removing three counters. Three counters have been removed from Selene, and we are summoning back the Blue Dragon Summoner. This might be the other piece to the puzzle in terms of assembling all five pieces. We're going to link summon Second further. Search. Cross sheep. Is there a fusion that we can go into? We got into the leg. So we now we know there are two pieces. Contact and fuse. <gasps> Con he's con contact fusing. That, that must be the fusion uh, Draco Slayer. Yes, Dino, 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 Dino Mister, Mist? the mighty Draco Slayer. Let's go summon back the <laughs> from the graveyard. It's now going to be able Ping. to summon back. 
gains counters chain link one. Chain I think that's two, why there's three Selene's in here. Yes, he's going to use Selene three times to assemble the three pieces to Exodia with the blue dragon. That's an arm. Two more pieces to go. I think we have found the way that he's doing this. So it's not an infinite loop. You know, sometimes these type of combo decks find a way of looping a certain card an infinite quantity of times until their alternate win condition has been found. He only needs to get four, plus, of course, the head. Please, Justin, let us see Exodia be put into the hand. Quite timely, talking about alternate win conditions in that How to Play video from the beginning of the day. <laughs> Little did you know, by round four of the YCS, you'd be seeing just that. And don't forget, Jeffrey is 3-0. and What's the strategy? It goes to show you that when you enter a YCS, there are many different ways in which you can find victory. Of course, reducing your opponent's life points to zero, or as Jeffrey may potentially ultimately do here, using Exodia the Forbidden One. We're going to Selene into Selene, and we're getting another search with the Blue Dragon Summoner. I think he just need one, needs one more piece, and... Oh, one more piece. I'm ex as excited as you are right now. Truly, in the over 20 years that I have played this game, the amount of times that I've actually seen Exodia assembled Search. is few and far between, and I certainly don't remember the last time I've seen it. So this and is one of the most exciting things that I've ever seen on That's the camera. final piece. And there it is. Exodia. Please. Is he going to assemble it? Oh, he yes, he is. He is assembling. Is. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Exodia, obliterate. Wow. <laughs> that was amazing. Jeffrey has taken down the first game of round four with a 3-0 record with Exodia the Forbidden One. Now I understand. The goal is to get to the Selene. You need to get the Selene. Yes. You need to get the time to put the the, uh, the blue dragon summoner into the graveyard and you need to cycle. That That is the Sangin. Yes, yes. We were looking at this deck list trying to figure out is there an infinite loop? Is there some type of way in which a combo just continually repeats the same pr process? It does, but it gets to the point of getting Exodia. But of course, Selene's the three. You can't play an infinite number of Selene's. But all you need is three. Yes. And uh, what a surprise, taking down one of the favored competition, Tierlements. Jeffrey also got to take a look at Justin's hand and see what he was playing. And when you're playing such a streamlined strategy like an Exodia deck, it's not like you can necessarily side deck in this very precise way. Looking at Jeffrey's side deck, it looks like he has just a bunch of cards that are generically good going second, which makes a lot of sense when your strategy is as focused as his is today. Well, I'm gonna, like, I think it's going to be a bit more difficult for uh, Jeffrey going into the second game, knowing that it is Tier Limits. Tier Limits have cards like uh, Kelbag and Aikido to just start to send cards directly from the deck to the graveyard. What those Exodia pieces get hit into the graveyard, it's not the easiest thing to retrieve either. How about the strategy that's so streamlined into just adding all the pieces? I do not see an obvious way to put an Exodia piece from the graveyard back into his hand, which could obviously be a problem when you're mm -hmm. playing against cards that can mill five from the top of both players' decks. Yes, that is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, we're going to see if uh, Justin's going to be pushing forward. Maybe he's going to alter his own strategy, just push for the additional, just send more cards than necessary right away. And hopefully he'll hit those Exodia pieces, making it so that you know Jeff can't just so push can through with his Exodia strategy. You know, if he's, add, for example, there. between the decision of summoning Diviner yeah, of the Herald nice or okay. Tolemon's Rhino Heart, yeah, you probably summon Diviner more often than not anyway, but just Invan, knowing that milling five off the top of both player decks could potentially stymie the Exodia strategy, mm -hmm. that might just be the play that he's tunnel visioning into, which makes a lot of sense in general anyway, but in this particular matchup, maybe even more the case. I think there's even more that we have to account for, because if we have to throw the Blue Dragon Summoner into the graveyard, while trying to summon it back, what if a Mudora happens that shuffles oh, it back into the deck? What if, you know, the Keldo shuffles it back? You know, those are another angle that, you know, you can attack Jeffrey's strategy. And Justin has some cards in the side deck. I'm not going to spoil them just yet, but some cards that are generically good if there's a specific card in your opponent's graveyard that is causing you trouble, like the Blue Dragon Summoner might. It's definitely a card that could be, that we might see here. Additionally, one other thing, we didn't necessarily see it there, but Justin is playing a small Shadal package, and by incorporating Shadals into your deck, you do have access to El Shadal Winda. If your opponent's trying to special summon countless times in one turn to assemble Exodia the Forbidden One, obviously putting that on the field can be pretty beneficial. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, look at this. Jeffrey's actually giving him a bit of history lesson about Yugi's grandpa. <laughs> How fitting, since he is the one of the Exodia players. Wow, that is a good question that Justin just asked. This is a question that's a good question to ask at the beginning of any round, which is how many cards you're playing. Some strategies actually gear above 40, and knowing how many cards in your opponent's deck, which is public information, it's not like you're asking something that is nefarious, 
by asking that, you can suddenly get a decent understanding of what your opponent could potentially be playing. There have been times in the game's history where you know, 50 card strategies were especially common, 60 card strategies were especially common, but other decks like Swords will exist that were all around 40, so by asking your opponent, wait, how many cards are you playing? You can start to limit and get an understanding of what your opponent could be playing. Not that asking <laughs> in this particular match would Justin have been able to predict that Jeffrey was about to show up with Exodia. That's yeah, a big surprise. Like 50 cards, often you associate them with adventure package, you know, things that you can just meld together, usually synergize really nicely with each other, get yourself some free negations. But I think the, this, is a, this is definitely a wild card match here. He definitely wants to break up the Exodia pieces. You don't want to obviously open many of these Exodia pieces. You're trying to search all five of them out, ideally. Mm -hmm. And because this deck is just filled with so many Fire Warrior or just Warrior in general extender monsters that can just special summon themselves from Shade Brigadine to all the others, this deck doesn't necessarily need to cut its, its number down. So we're going into game two now. I believe Justin is going to choose to go first. I don't think uh, passing that opportunity is a, is a wise choice. So he's going to start off by going first. Starting off with... Looks like a copy of Foolish Burial Goods. Which card would he send to the graveyard? Potential Trivi Karma. Trivi Karma is typically the card that I would send because getting access to the field spell allows you to set up an additional layer of interruption, which if I'm playing against Exodia and I'm unsure what exactly is going to happen in game two, maybe Jeffrey has a totally different strategy. I want as many layers of interaction as possible. That adds the Parlor Reno into the hand. We're going to activate Parlor Reno right away. Field spell. That's going to allow him to add a Tealman's card into the hand. I did see a copy of Dark Ruler No More in Jeffrey's hand, so it will be interesting to see how that lines up against Justin's strategy. All right, the beauty of Tear Elements is that historically it's been able to layer its interactions, you know, with graveyard disruptions, with cards like the Shuffler Reflex, such as Mudora, to being able to use the Primeval Planet, to potentially even having in hand effects. So a simple card like Dark Ruler No More may only take out one of those layers. And if Jeffrey needs to get through several layers, it might be difficult. Yeah. And starting off with the Special Summon of Sharon, sending the Chill Elements cast here into the graveyard. We're going to send to the graveyard. Oh, DD Crow. Not the yeah. best send, but we do hit uh, two cards. We have Rhino Heart, and I believe that is Soliac. DD Crow is a card I was partially commenting on during the side decking phase. Whether you're playing the Bestial Package or DD Crow or a combination of okay, both, Obviously, in Jeffrey's shoes, you don't want your opponent to have DD Crow. DD Crow on any of the Exodia pieces, obviously, would be game over. And then, in addition to that, on the Blue Dragon Summoner. Yes. Now, the Bestial Package would not work against it would the not, exactly. Blue Dragon Summoner, because that one is uh, Wind. Wind Monster, yeah. I actually had to go check that myself. It's one of those things that you know, the Bestials, by and large, against the decks that you'd want to side them in, are better. But having additional cards like DD Crow that have a little bit of a higher range, although you don't actually get to put a monster on the field, you know, in this particular case, Justin's probably happy that he's got a couple copies of DD Crow at his disposal. So we did send eight cards to the grave from the Scream and the Sharon and the Tierlemans Cash Tira. That led to a, a lot of cards just loaded into the graveyard, adding into hand. I believe that's a halfness. Notably, it doesn't appear as though any of them were Kelbeck, Mudora, or any of those. Yeah, that's uh, pretty safe for Jeff. That's important because those cards in both directions are forms of interruption, either by making it so that there's a shuffle effect. But that mill five, I still am not convinced that Jeffrey has a way of winning if an Exodia piece hits the graveyard. Yeah, it's going to be very, very tight. But there's also potentially that you could, like you said earlier, you know, layering the disruption. There could be uh, Tillman's Crime that could be in the back as well. There could also be Soliac just to negate the effects of certain monsters like Selene so that you can't just revive the card straight from the graveyard. We're going to get into Fusion Ooh, Summon to a, so, a Dragon of the Swamp. I think I can see where this one is going. If Justin is playing a copy of Abyss Dweller, Abyss Dweller is going to line up perfectly against Blue Dragon Summoner. Oh, that is also another way to shut that entire play down. So, so looks as, like it, it does look yeah. like it. He has the two cards stacked on top of each other. We're performing an XC Summon. Oh, oh, he's choosing to go into Bahamut Shark. That's an interesting choice. I mean, totally. yes, Totally Awesome is a awesome card, no pun intended. But I think if I sat through watching Blue Dragon Summoner hit the field as many times as I just did, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, I think maybe you can use the the Toad. Oh, Toad cannot actually take the card because it doesn't destroy it, I believe. My instincts would have been to go into Abyss Dweller there. But... Oh, we're going to see Sprint. Adding back the water. Okay. So we got Teal Elements Cashier added back to hand. Still hasn't used the summon effect of it yet. 
He also still has a level four in the field, so it, it may be possible that he's able to get that back onto the field in some way, shape, or form, and then go into Abyss Dweller. As you mentioned before, Jeffrey does have a Dark Rhythm no more, but that's not going to matter when the Abyss Dweller hits the field. Exactly, exactly. So he's putting the Totally Awesome back into his extra deck and conducting his Fusion Summon. Well, that's three monsters. I'm going to take a wild guess here that's going to be Kaleido Heart. Kaleido Heart, absolutely. From one Aqua to, I believe he's a Fiend. Watching Justin trying to navigate this opening turn, obviously playing it's a strategy that presumably he's never seen before. You know, it's interesting to be in his shoes and think to yourself, based on what I have seen, what are the interruptions that I need to try and layer this turn? Here he's using the effect of Perla Rhino to destroy his own Sheeran, because of course Clyde Hart was summoned to the field by returning a tier element to the deck. And now he's gonna be able to conduct another fusion summon. Looks like for potentially Predaplant. Yeah. Brickostapelia, which, you know, would line up well against some of the cards that Jeffrey did play in that first game, like a soul day. Oh boy. Definitely Looks have like, to put yeah. more thought into this because he knows that if he's unsuccessful, it's game over for this entire match. I mean, he is one game down already, which is unfortunate. You know, he did not get to go first on it. And now he has to commit into a board where he feels comfortable that it's strong enough to stop everything that, you know, Jeffrey has to offer. So here's some just general information about Justin's deck list. We saw two danger monsters. Now, there are a lot of options for the tier element players this weekend. Do you incorporate the Horus package, the King of the Swamps package, a combination thereof? Justin here, as you can see from those last three mills, is incorporating the Danger package, which I'd say is relatively popular, all things considered. Mm -hmm. Both Danger Nessie and Danger Mothman. Now, I think things can go... Ooh, so he's going to send into the graveyard the Unchained Soul uh, Shayama. It's a wonderful card in the deck as well because you can destroy one of your own cards and, and just more or less uh, summon out a free level 6 monster onto the field. And then you get to trigger the effect of Kaleido Heart. Mm -hmm. And it is a Fiend. Remember, that's right. Kaleido Heart is a Fiend, which doesn't match up with any other typing within the Tier Elements deck, but it works out perfectly in this case. And it's not you know, typically the case that a unchained card would find its way into a strategy like this when there's an entire unchained deck itself that's devoted to the mm -hmm. strategy that is perfectly playable. So it's interesting to see the deck building decisions. You know, I commented on whether it's the Shadal package, the Danger package, the Horus package. How about a small unchained card in your tier element strategy as well? You know, it works pretty well, especially that the Unchained card is also level 6, so it might lead into, like, a Beatrice play, giving you just a quick effect to send more monsters into the graveyard, send cards into the graveyard, and uh, pr maybe fetching you the card that you're missing. It does seem like he is going to go into an IP Little Knight. Oh, that's SP Little oh, Knight? sorry, yes. SP. 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 Well, that's a lot of uh, interactions here. Is it enough, though? Because, you know, Jeffrey could have a card like Harpy's Feather Duster, evenly matched, and we know he has the Dark Ruler no more. If he can combine a couple of those, what we would call the you know, board breakers, Justin's field is strong, but it might not be strong enough. It'll be interesting to see if Justin did, in fact, draw his copy of Tier Elements Crime. Santa Claus has come to town, and it has uh, just tributed off the screen. Two Santa Clauses have been taken out. <laughs> now, that's going to happen. Scream? Five. Oh, ooh, okay. So you definitely want to arrange this so that Skamada is going to be chain link two to get the beast. Uh, it no, that, like... was, that was not enough. Okay, that was an interesting one. So Jeffrey simply just had a hand filled with Santa Claus. We knew he had the Dark Ruler no more. Three cards must not have been enough to combo from that point. But he did play the crowd by dropping both of those Santa Clauses before conceding. Oh, that was wonderful. There is definitely something about Jeffrey, and he definitely plays to the crowd. It's a beautiful thing to see. Oh, absolutely. But Justin there was able to take down game two. We saw that he had Didi Crow in his side deck based on what we saw here in game two. So if there is some resistance that he'll be able to have in his deck, having to go second in the vital game three. He'll have, of course, that one single copy of Happiness. He'll have, of course, his copies of Didi Crow. Hellback. You might be able to Hellbeck. use, uh, uh, as you mentioned, the Crow. Maybe if he has a tier limit cast here and he sends more cards into the grave, but maybe he'll be able to hit the Udora and the Gia Keldos. He also 
is playing a higher fairy count and incorporating Herald of the Orange Light. I know we haven't seen it yet, but there is a Herald of the Orange Light in his deck. That card can obviously line up quite well if Jeffrey's not anticipating a card like that. So it'll be interesting to see. It's not completely such that because Jeffrey's about to go first uh, that this match is settled. There are a variety of cards that Justin can draw in combinations thereof to push back against the Exodia's draft. Yeah. If it was, uh, was going to guarantee the win, it would have went all the way without, you know, uh, without any resistance here. So this is going to really rely on the first five cards. This turn one is the all-important turn one in the all-important game three. And speaking of five cards, I mean, there is a percentage chance that the five cards on top of Jeffrey's deck are the five pieces. To the Not that likely to happen. Is, uh, that is really that would, rare. That would be playing to the crowd, too, if the stars align that way. But as you saw, Jeffrey doesn't even need to do that. His deck has found a way to assemble all five pieces. Simply with just two warriors. Simply with just two warriors. Through a Kelbeck. Yeah. I, I find his list very interesting here. Playing fusion armaments to summon out fusion. Fusion contact, summon out fusion. fusion. Instant fusion, summon out fusion. And ready fusion to summon out fusion. Yeah, Jeffrey has come with basically every variety of putting a fusion monster on the field for a 1,000 or similar life point increment. Well, if you're going to be, you know, taking damage like that, this is definitely a deck that you got to make sure that running out of time does not matter because you're only being playing in the main phase anyway. Yeah, Jeffrey doesn't need to go anywhere. We were talking about alternate win conditions earlier. Jeffrey has found an alternate win condition that can win regardless of, the, of whether you ever see a battle phase. You just need that single one main phase. What would, what would the other kinds of disruption that Justin would need? Would he, do you think he needs at least two in this upcoming game? So one wasn't enough, and because so much of Jeffrey's deck is geared towards extending beyond an interruption, I think he needs multiple. Jeffrey has the huge luxury, this is the case with a lot of combo decks that exist, whether it's a Zodia deck or some of the others out there. In game two, he had Dark Ruler No More, an evenly matched, and Santa Claus in his deck, and every single one of those cards that you draw is one less combo piece. Now, Jeffrey really wants to look at his opening hand and see five combo pieces. And he gets to side out these cards that are not in and of themselves combo pieces. But you can actually hear the crowd in the background. You know, Jeffrey is playing to the crowd. This is wonderful. This is what I like to see. And here we go into the game three here at YCS Indianapolis. Exodia the Forbidden One going first. Okay, well, I'm pretty sure Jeffrey has the combo. I would imagine many of his opening hands have the combo. It's really a question of does Justin have a counter? Okay, so special summon jump forward, and then we summon out the connector. We know the connector gets you there. Okay, this looks like it might be a herald. It is. It is herald taking out the name, and that takes out the diviner in hand. Justin down to three cards in hand. The can count won't matter a lot right now. It depends on whether or not Justin has another follow-up. I think uh, there's going to be more ways, perhaps? Looks like he has a Rinald, but I don't know if Junk Forward is a no, fire monster. No, it is not. It is yes. an Earth monster. Does it... Does it only need a warrior monster? Uh, or am I... Oh, oh no, no, we are... We are yeah, it is going a fire. Back. Yeah, it's fire, fire only. Oh... This goes like here, actually. You can't touch Justin feeling pretty happy about that. I, I don't know if he has any more disruptions. You can oh, tell on Jeffrey's nice. face that <laughs> his face has soured in. Oh, man. Gotta be a fire warrior. Unfortunate combination, I would say. He has another connector in hand as well. And an Ignite Pendulum Monster, so he is unable to make a play with that current hand. Well, that depends whether or not Justin can make a play, or maybe he overcorrected his uh, new deck at post side and does not have a starter himself. It happens you, from time to time. You don't need too much. That's true. That is true. But going into a deck that can win on the very first turn, some people might overcommit because you just have to see it. Like, you have to see it. Now... Oh, wow. Justin's face looks... This is quite an entertaining match. Just watching these players really enjoying being here. Really enjoying this match, even though it's a match that you might not typically anticipate seeing. Now, knowing that Jeffrey went first, if you decide to go first, you might not put as many disruptions because you're only expecting to win on that very first turn. I, I don't think... I don't know you have your disruptions. You're not going to have any. If you're playing a strategy like this, you are not giving Dark Ruler, Evenly Mad, Feather Dust, or any of those type of cards. Santa Claus... Oh, my... Oh, no! He's proceeding to set one monster face and pass oh. the turn! 
be another oh. turn to try again. And he has a new normal summon. He can keep on going. We're going to see if Justin's hand has it. Oh, he, he needs to draw. He's so excited. Look at Justin Ooh. being like, you need to draw. He was so excited, he put his glasses back oh. on, ready to go. The problem here is that this probably means that Justin has interactions in the hand, so we'll see if this goes through. As I just mentioned here, now another connector has been summoned onto the field. Are we going to be able to get a peek into the hand? Is there another Divine? Oh, Ash Blossom Joy Spring preventing the peek in the hand, but there's still two warriors on the field. And will it... Will we get there? We got 50 minutes on the clock still available. That's plenty of time to execute the strategy. And again, he's going to win in this main phase if this combo goes uninterrupted, so there are no battle phases needed. There's the assault, a tail, two tails of the Noble Knights. Oh, oh, it's oh he, took, he took off the seatbelt now. He's ready to go full throttle now. No holding back. And the effect to add is resolving, which I then assume going to mean that the effect to special summon from the deck is going to resolve. Can you believe what we're about to see? Yeah, I can't believe it. Right now we're seeing Exodia win. So this is the adding this is adding the pendulum skill. So you can still activate the pendulum because you just can't uh, summon out that card. And he has another copy of an Ignite in his hand, so it's actually huge that he can put both of the pendulum zones covered. His sold effect, we're going to send a, an equip into the graveyard to summon out a level one from the deck. There's the Durandal. Durandal, yep. Yeah. I'm going to take a wild guess that's going to be a Renault so they can add back the Durandal, but I could be wrong. Could be Squeak and I could be any of these guys. He has Renault in hand already. Remember, he tried to summon. I mean, he that's can true. summon an another copy of it. It, it, it is, is a Fire copy. Warrior. It is not restricted. You can special summon the other one from your hand just for having a Fire Warrior. So, although it in and of itself is a Fire Warrior, there is no restriction. Durandal effect targeting the Renault effect of Durandal, destroying itself, and to add a Fire Warrior into hand. This is where we're going to get Ignis. We're going to see this one play out now. It's really interesting how all these differing strategies and different archetypes overlap with each other. Now, the fact that Ignis is a fire warrior combining with the Durandal, it, it's really, really exciting to see. It's like a jigsaw puzzle that you piece together from other jigsaw puzzles, but somehow the pieces still work, and it still completes the entire puzzle. I feel like a lot of pendulum strategies have historically had that type of feel to them. Mm -hmm. And we get the Templar. I believe that's, yeah, that's a Templar. And now Ignis is going to allow him to special summon a Ignite from his deck. That's Gallant. No, no, no. That is... I believe that is Gallant. Synchro. We're going to perform a Synchro Summon. All right, we saw... Wait. Warrior Rocks in the first game, and now we get to see it again here. Adding back the Ignite from the Extra Deck Zone through its effect. Now I think it's where we're going to start to see and Beyond the Pendulum, yep. Beyond the Pendulum, we're going to load the scales up. Justin but sitting back in his chair thinking, I've seen this before. Oh, yeah, deja vu. It's a repeat. He's repeating some of the iconic opening episodes of the Yu-Gi-Oh! Oh, oh this yeah. Show. This is episode one with Exodia. It is. He's just repeating it over again. Justin also sitting here for the ride now. Now, this might have been the case where you, you have to put in so many cards to counter the strategy, you might not have the pieces for you to start your own engine and make, make sure that you get going. I can't imagine that he would side out cards in his own deck, though, that are classified as starters. You know, I would imagine that he would side out a maybe a, a Divine Incarnate type card that obviously isn't going to line maybe up. Maybe the Nessies, Mothmans. The, you don't need those ones because yeah. they're, they're not good to open. They are pseudo starters at times, right? They can start pushing to the field, particularly a card like Mothman that can put a level four in the field. So I don't know if I necessarily side those. Oh, oh, oh here, here it is. Yeah, here it is. Yep. Time Star Magician searches out Exodia, the Forbidden One. Destroy, protect. We're destroying the Time Star Magician. This is an incredible interaction. Being able to dump, dump the Blue Dragon Summoner through this interaction of protecting the Time Star Magician is genius. And I, Celine's coming onto the field now. The one of three Celines that we will be seeing. Oh boy. And this. 
combo inherently puts a spell in the graveyard because of a soul day. So if there was ever that concern that you didn't actually get access to a spell and you only relied on your two pendulums, well, nope, this combo puts three, so Selene is always going to be able to special summon. Likely we're going to see a Crossy being summoned right after this. Yep, take the Selene, take the Blue Dragon Summoner. And we do have the, uh, the Ignis and the Draco Slayer and, and the Pendulum. We have everything we need. We have one leg. Three more to go. And now he's going to conduct the Fusion Summon by tributing both of these for the Dino Nister Power, the Mighty Draco Slayer. And that's going to trigger the Cross Sheep effect. Blue Dragon Summoner. And Blue Dragon Summoner left the keys on the field, decided to come back and grab them again thanks to the effect of Cross Sheep. Justin just trying to check everything, make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed by just verifying the fusion requirements, or in this case, for the alternate summoning requirements of Dino Nister Power, the mighty Draco Slayer. Second Selene. Now, getting any of those Selene's would be so high value. I think there's just exactly enough to do it. There's the arm. Uh, Justin's face is just priceless. And you can hear the crowd. The crowd gonna, goes wild here. I'm just going to let them take the wheel right here. Celine number three. Celine number three is going on board. <laughs> He's going to do it. There's all the ton. Oh, boy. Another leg. One more piece. The crowd is chanting, one more piece. <laughs> this is a historical moment here in Indianapolis. Oh, my goodness. It has been an honor to sit in the booth and watch Jeffrey in games one and three. In Appaloosa? Oh, just for the extra bet, just in case. Just in case. We're going to go into Appaloosa at the end of this. This is clean. This is very clean. We got the other arm. <laughs> and all five pieces have been assembled. The legs, the arms, the head. Exodia obliterates. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow, the crowd goes insane. <laughs> this is the kind of feature match we love to see. This is one of the most iconic events. Billy earlier today talked about this building having something about it in Yu-Gi-Oh's history.